Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sharon Terry from Genetic Alliance, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome all of you to our series, uh, What About Privacy and Progress in Whole Genome Sequencing? As uh, all of you know, I think by now, this has um, been a webinar series and continues to be on the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues report entitled Privacy and Progress in Whole Genome Sequencing. Uh, I also want to say that we're very grateful to the University of Washington Center for Genomics and Healthcare Equality, which has sponsored this series along with Genetic Alliance, and we're very proud to have that partnership with them. This is our um, actually, let me think, uh, eighth of, in this series. All of the series are uh, recorded and on our website under geneticalliance.org slash webinars. Um, you can hear all of the rest of them there, and this one will be recorded as well. So the presentations you will hear today will be available both in uh, uh, audio video as well as uh, slide presentations. Um, we are um, also taking questions, as we usually do, which means we will not open the lines. Uh, we had about 250 people register for this webinar, and it gets a little crazy if we do that. And so instead, we ask you at any time during the presentation to feel free to um, use the question box on the GoToMeeting uh, control panel there on the side and type in your question. I will be collating questions throughout the speakers' uh, times, and then at the end of their presentations, I'll be uh, relaying your questions to them, hopefully in some logical and organized manner. Uh, if we get dozens of questions, I can't predict that they will be that organized or logical. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, we're going to begin with Lisa Lee. Lisa is the executive director of the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. Lisa? Good afternoon, and thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we're going to talk today about um, I'm having trouble advancing my slide. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, about the Privacy and Progress Report, I'm going to highlight um, the key findings of the report and then um, talk a little bit about um, some topics that we, the Commission examined in their ethical analysis. I'll highlight a couple of events that um, have been, um, that have occurred that uh, are important in terms of the Commission's recommendations um, that have followed the report's release. So we released the report in October of 2012, and a couple of important current events have occurred, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then, um, highlight what, uh, which of the report and commission recommendations um, are particularly um, important due to these uh, couple of, of events. Now, I know the, the seminar, the web series has um, been reviewing and talking about the different recommendations that the commission made in Privacy and Progress, so I'm not going to go through each recommendation and talk about that, but I did want to highlight um, a couple of, of specific things that are pertinent to the recent events that have occurred. So that's how I'll spend my time. For those of you who don't know about the Commission or who might be new listening in to this particular uh, set in the series, um, we are a commission that uh, is uh, appoint the Commission members are appointed by the President. And this commission takes on various topics related to all areas of science and health, um, not just specific to genetics and um, not just specific to privacy, but actually any bioethics topic. So this is one of many topics that we've, we've um, studied over the last few years of our, the commission's existence. We have multidisciplinary membership, including folks from medicine, nursing, science, philosophy, theology, humanities, law. Um, just about every uh, discipline that brings something to bear on bioethics. So we do have many disciplines and many perspectives brought to bear on each of these topics. For privacy and progress, specifically, the Bioethics Commission's goal was to find a feasible way, the most feasible way of reconciling two um, givens. One is that we know that there's enormous medical potential of whole genome sequencing. A lot of change in the field, a lot of more accessible in terms of cost and also technology, more accessible technologies um, that will only help uh, in terms of medical uh, revelations and medical technologies. We have to reconcile this with the pressing privacy and data access issues that are raised by the fact that 
these technologies are available and readily accessible by many more people, not just medical providers, but researchers and others as well. So it is this reconciling of the potential progress and the privacy from which our name comes, privacy and progress, and also the key considerations we um, that the Commission uh, looked at as they were uh, examining this, these issues. So the key findings after um, some time studying this, uh, the, these issues were that we, the Commission felt that the U.S. Go governance structure and oversight structure for genetic and genomic data currently do not fully protect individuals from the risks that are associated with sharing their whole, whole genome sequence data. Um, we really, the, the Commission was really hopeful and, and made recommendations that future policies must reconcile these anticipated societal benefits that we spoke about earlier with the potential privacy risks to individuals. And the reason clearly all of, all of you know is that realizing this promise of whole genome sequencing is going to require a lot of data. It's really important that we have widespread public participation and individuals have to be willing to share their genomic data in order for this progress to be made. Um, and so this protection is crucial for people to share their data. Data are needed for scientific progress and privacy is necessary for people to share their data. Um, the Commission looked at five areas for ethical analysis. It looked at strong baseline protections while promoting access and sharing. This is the key in terms of what's required for progress. Looked at an area of data security and considered access to databases for, for ensuring progress. A very key ethical consideration in all of research and medical progress is informed consent, that people actually know what's happening with their data and um, their medical information and consent to that. And then also facilitating progress um, in whole genome sequencing by encouraging data sharing, uh, which will in turn require these security uh, um, and, and security policies and, and access um, uh, policies. And finally, public benefit. We're really the commission was really interested in thinking about and, and um, thinking about ways to recommend just distributions. Uh, the just distribution of burdens and benefits. This comes into play when we think about um, the fact that we invest, as, as a public, we invest a lot of money, a great deal of money into this science, and we expect um, great things to come from it. We, if we want to ensure that all people have access to the results of this, we have to ensure, especially in genomic um, studies and genomic development of genomic technologies, that people participate, people of all kinds participate in the research because it's that participation that will yield the kinds of or the kinds of results that will um, yield the benefits to all persons in the public. So I'd like to talk for a minute now about um, the fact that the report noted that. Um, many in the genomic research community, as we were doing this and seeking input from, from the community and interested persons, many expressed a concern that um, there, there was this hypothetical possibility that re-identification of genomic sequencing could occur. That means that even if you stripped persons in from a, a person's typical identifiers like name and date of birth or any others, um, from the genetic data that there is, there would be this hypothetical possibility that from the AATs, Cs, and Gs, one could potentially re-identify the data. So this was a, a very big concern, a very obviously a big privacy concern, and we noted that many genomic researchers expressed concern about this, that this might be a possibility. Well, three months after the report was released, there was a study published in Science by Gimmerich et al. that made it clear that these concerns were not only possible, but in fact, this is exactly what that team had done. They had um, successfully uncovered the full identities of at least 50 individuals um, through only using their ACs, Ts, and Gs and available data on the, uh, data available on the Internet. 
Another interesting, maybe um, uh, less um, identifiable, but another very interesting and possibly concerning, uh, one person actually said creepy, um, uh, event that has occurred just recently in the beginning of this month um, highlights the importance of use and or misuse of data. Um, we talk about data access and, and um, the concerns over having access to genetic data. And we talked a lot when, we were, when the commission was doing this report about whether access meant just access to the f data files or if it meant access to genetic material. And uh, there's been a project uh, by an ARA New York artist, Heather Dewey Hagborg, called Stranger Visions. And she actually, um, the, the concerns over access to, to these kinds of materials were highlighted by her collecting chewed gum, cigarette butts, hairs that were left in cones, et cetera, and sequen sequencing them to identify characteristics of people, their eye color, their um, propensity to be overweight, et cetera, and then creating with a 3D printer a three-dimensional likeness of the gum chewer's or the smoker's face. So um, she looked, this artist looked in public places for these things and then printed out in this 3D printer what she thought this person might look like based on their genetic characteristics. Now it wasn't an actual likeness, um, at least not yet. Um, so when we think about what's happened since the commission released the report, since we, when we think about these events, what does this mean? What do these recent events tell us? Well, one really important piece that was um, highlighted by uh, Laura Rodriguez uh, in uh, uh, response to one of the articles, the science article, is that we really need to be thinking about reconsidering the distinction between what is identifiable and non-identifiable. So a, a string of um, A, C's, T's, and G's um, determining whether that string of data is identifiable or not is less like a bright line and more like a continuum. And so when we think about the possibility that in a short order or very short time, it might be in fact that that string of data becomes as identifiable as if you put a, you know, you put a quote into Google and you can find out who said it. Maybe if we end up doing some kind of search like that on a string of ACs, Cs, and Gs, we can determine whose they are. So it becomes, as we reconcile privacy and this progress, it becomes less about what makes something identifiable um, and more about what it takes to keep something private. And so the commission talked about um, privacy a great deal in this report and found that privacy really is secured or breached based on several things. One is an individual has to determine that they're willing to disclose the information, or in this case, give a sample. Um, the other piece that's really important is that somebody else has to have access to the data. Privacy can't be breached if somebody else doesn't have access. And critically, the, the person who has access has to use or misuse the data. In, in the case of breaching privacy, it's misusing. In the case of securing it, it's appropriate use. Given that, the Commission recommended two important tools to protect privacy. The first um, is informed consent, and that has to do with the individuals making an informed decision about whether to disclose the information, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and the other is a consistent floor of protections for data access. Now, this has to do with the, the second to the access and the use or misuse of data. So data have to be secured. Um, so this consistent floor has to um, include security, consistent security of data across all states, across all contexts, et cetera. Um, it has to include professional expectations uh, where it's expected, it's a professional norm that data are protected and that um, it is not okay to share uh, data uh, against um, wishes of a participant. And finally, accountability and consequences for violators. So let's look at each of these. For informed consent, 
um, the Commission really talked about informing participants of potential risks. So this includes things like what the risks are related to informational privacy, as well as describing how these risks are mitigated in a certain situation. So there might be risks, but there are also um, clearly ways to mitigate these risks. Um, so th those are important to describe as well. Um, important to describe the benefits of participation. Clearly, there are, we, as we all have agreed, there are many benefits to this kind of research and this kind of um, studies. And to ascertain participation preferences for data use um, at the time of, do, of, of giving the sample, this as well as for future data use. And one of the things that was really important to the commission was um, their recommendation to, to have um, studied flexible ways to ascertain or honor these kinds of participant preferences. And there are some incredibly creative and useful ways that uh, researchers are now um, implementing um, con consent, flexible and, and, and great uh, ways to, to keep in contact for, with informed consent. Lisa, so, could you, um, there was a little glitch in our, I think in our technology in the line, and someone just said they couldn't hear your last line there, if you could just repeat that. Sure thing. Um, the other piece is important in terms of um, ascertaining current and future uh, participant preferences for data use. This is really important in terms of considering um, not just potentially getting that, that um, preference at the time of the specimen being collected, but there are, there are many ways in which researchers are, are developing creative ways to be flexible in terms of ascertaining and honoring patient participant and patient preferences for data use. And the, par the commission encouraged uh, study of these kinds of consent models uh, to, to ensure that patient and participant preferences are honored. Um, when we turn to this, con this second and, and critical piece in terms of securing privacy, is, and that is securing a consistent floor of protections, one of the findings that the Commission had was it was very clear that laws, regulations, policies, um, et cetera, across states, across, across agencies, across um, research institutions varied dramatically. In some states, it's completely legal to take somebody's discarded gum and do, you know, do a whole genome sequence, as we saw in New York. In other states, that's not legal. So um, the commission did recommend a consistent floor of protections to include um, consistent consent and participant preferences to um, include guiding all persons who work with genomic data, whether that's a researcher, a clinician, a data manager, an IT professional, that they all are guided by professional ethical standards related to privacy and confidentiality, and that they're held accountable to state and federal regulations in the case of breach or of, ident of identity or confidentiality. So there um, are, are, are some ways in which we, we are talking about how to, um, to look at these new and, and uh, new developments and what's happened with whole genome sequence data since the report came out. Our next steps um, for the commission, and one thing we weren't able to fully address in the privacy uh, report is to look at incidental findings related to whole genome sequencing. And currently, the commission is, is uh, uh, working on a report that is looking at ethical analyses and recommendations that will address incidental findings in three contexts, looking at clinical care, research, and direct-to-consumer testing. As we started to talk about incidental findings in the context of whole genome sequencing, we, it was clear that that's not the only modality in which incidental findings um, get, uh, appear, so we also will be expanding this topic of incidental findings into other modalities, including imaging and biological specimens. But we will have more to say on um, managing incidental findings in this upcoming report, which we hope to release to the President by the end of 
this coming year. All right, I understand that um, we have, uh, we'll have another speaker and then we'll have some time for discussion. I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Super, thanks very much. And I'm going to pass the controls over in a moment uh, to our second speaker. Uh, Kelly Edwards is an associate professor in the School of Medicine at University of Washington. She's in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities. And she's also the associate dean uh, for graduate students, I believe. And I'm going to make Kelly the presenter. And she will give us her perspective uh, in response. It's in your hands, I think, Kelly. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you see my slides? Let's see. Yes. And we've had a request from a couple of folks if you guys could speak a little louder. I think it's more our system today, for some reason, through GoToMeeting than you guys. But if you could speak up a little, that'll happen. help. Sure. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Sharon Terry and Genetic Alliance, for hosting this um, whole year-long series to really explore and have a conversation about these important issues. And our uh, charge this week, uh, we had the privilege of being able to do the summary, um, which lets us kind of take a look back at what's been discussed over the last nine months and in the report. And as Lisa just did start to look ahead um, at what's coming next. I framed my talk um, thinking about privacy versus progress. And I, and I realized, and that's partly because I think even in how uh, Lisa's remarks come, you know, come through is on reconciling these two. I think this is often, we often see this as something that has to be balanced against each other rather than something that can can work in concert together. And I think that's really something I would like to challenge us to think about. Um, how are these necessarily are these necessarily in opposition or one coming at the expense of the other? So that's just something for us to think about. Okay. I'd like to move forward. There we go. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the points of controversy that I see coming out of the topics of the President's Commission report um, and that have been under debate both in the field of bioethics and in genetic research. Um, and these can be points that we can come back to in the discussion. Um, one of them is just purely the nature of informed consent and what counts as effective um, and sufficient informed consent. And there's there's about 8,000 articles on, on what, what really is appropriate here. Um, and we're, we're able to see some really excellent demonstration projects rolling out right now to really finally test some of these models and see um, how people experience them and if they are, if participants are feeling like they understand what they're getting into. A second area of significant uh, controversy and debate is the returning results conversation. There was a whole a webinar hour devoted to this topic, so I won't reprise it. But it's just to flag that we know um, it is not at all resolved what, what we might owe to participants and to their families as we're getting increasing information, um, really robust and rich information, and yet still uncertain and changeable uh, information as we get into whole, sequ uh, whole genome sequence. And incidental findings, um, this, you know, uh, a Hastings Center report just came out this summer really asking the question, it's when you're talking about whole genome sequence, what, what really counts as incidental anymore? And this is going to be an important topic for the President's Commission to take on in their next report. Uh, the area of data access and data sharing, how, how broad and how open can and should we be with, with the data that we have? Uh, what kinds of restrictions do we place on this data, uh, data access and data sharing? These are also very um, up for debate. And then finally, a final point of controversy that this, this report points us to is just the nature of the governance that we employ in these systems, which is what pro kind of moving beyond consent uh, processes and and data sharing. What what all needs to be in place in a governance model that really helps this be a, a, a um, 
really demonstrate our stewardship uh, of the of the system and really how do we enact stewardship when we've got such diverse patient populations and public uh, preferences around what happens with their data. So we can come back to any of those because those are all really important points that this, this President's Commission report gets to. Okay, I'm going to focus my remarks um, really on how do we, I think underlying all of this is we want to build a, a genomic research enterprise that is trustworthy. And so it really takes some careful thought about what, how do we build trust and, and what goes into promoting trust um, and facilitating that. And this, this is something that we've, we're also developing both a lot of theory about and a lot of demonstrated practice. Um, where we have some robust examples of really trustworthy systems and we can take a look at what those, those uh, genomic researchers have done to really facilitate trust. One thing, one thing that we've noticed um, when we've been looking at this within the Genetic Alliance and their whole BioTrust enterprise is really a lot of what this means is moving beyond the language of protection. And I know we've been somewhat, um, you know, we're, we're appropriately respectful of the, the human subjects regulations, the federal regulations that mandate protection of human subjects. And yet, I think what one thing we are thinking about is that the, the floor, the regulations provide the floor of our behavior, and it really is up to us. That's not the end of the story. Um, it's really up to us as a whole community to set our standards of excellence. And so you can have the most robust protections, data protections in place, and privacy protections uh, in the world even, and not have that be experienced as demonstrating respect or experienced as uh, respectful practices. And so thinking about these as two separate things, both of which are merit attention, but not doing one at the expense of the other. So one thing, if you dive into the respect and trust thread a little bit more, you know, our, our Center for Genomics and Healthcare Equality has done a lot of work on ethics of partnership and what it takes to really demonstrate respect between researchers and participants. And part of this has to do with, it all comes down to relationships and accountability um, so that you've developed a track record of really walking your, walking your talk um, that you follow through uh, and make good on what your what your agreements are saying you're you're doing, and that all of this is really done in a spirit of of collaboration and partnership, where you value the contributions of the other, um, and all of that works to in, engender trust. So, a lot of what we're trying to do is move pe move past what has traditionally been an us them relationship or us you know a researcher subject relationship uh, to one that, that really invites um, collaboration and the sense that we are all in it together and it's going to take all of us. And when you take those same, the spirit of what's there and what uh, many uh, groups have learned about how to do effective partnerships uh, with, with communities and with part research participants, really that, that cuts across all of our research relationships and that's that's something to that we've that's become even more important as we've done some of these larger scale research projects. It's become clear that you know treat, uh, treating the clinicians in the hospital uh, where you're collecting samples, uh, the clinical groups, the clinical staff, uh, when you're trying to share across institutions and organizations, um, that all of these relationships require the same the same principles and practices of respect, accountability, doing what you're, what you're going to say you're going to do, and, and really valuing the contribution that all the players make in this. So this is, this is just something for us to think about as we, we build up the whole system that the genome research enterprise is going to nest within. And of course, um, I'm sure this case study has been mentioned a lot on, in this series. And I think we can't, we, we just can't overstate how um, really the, the gift of this story, uh, which has really brought many of these issues to the public, uh, public eye in a way that 
they wouldn't have been without without either the best-selling book or the some of the New York Times uh, stories that have followed. Um, which is that we we do have a public now who's asking really important questions of us. Um, you know, who where who's using my stuff? Who is making these decisions? You know, is someone making money uh, on my data or on my on my samples? Um, how will I know? You know what what are the benefits that you're pursuing? Um, what and what counts as a benefit? Do I do I get to have a say in um, in what I think is beneficial about the research you're doing with with my stuff? So I think for every system that's getting set up, we need to start having answers to these <laughs> these questions. Um, what often happens is this is just one example from one of our hospital consent forms where we have, we, we've recognized we need to include, uh, and this is called an opt-in approach to uh, sharing your genetic information uh, for future research purposes. Um, sometimes the opt-in approach is, is just a one-liner like this. And so thinking about what counts as, as helping someone make an informed choice about what they're doing with their genetic information and um, what kinds of future uses they might anticipate. So how do we and 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 what counts um, what counts as harms to be thinking about? I think Lisa mentioned a lot of the informed consent literature talks about well let's be upfront about the nature of the risks involved or the nature of the potential harms, including informational harms. I think the Havasupai story also is another case study that helps us remember it's really difficult to anticipate what might count as a harm to an individual or to a community. And in, in this particular case, um, there's the harms uh, that they could have been about um, group harms or harms that happen to a whole community's identity, not an individual's identity. And also just the, the harm of disrespect, which is what we might say where something happened with my samples that was not what I expected. I, I agreed to one set of things and something else happened and that was experienced as a harm and also a sign of, of deep, deep disrespect. So I think thinking more creatively about what counts as benefits to people as well as what counts as harms is going to be important for us going forward. Um, one thing that we're working on is moving some of the education and community conversations about genomics and genetic research and these large-scale data projects is moving moving the education um, and edu engagement outside of the consent moment so that the first moment someone is thinking about genetic research isn't when they're in the hospital um, facing a, you know, with other stressful things going on in their life um, and they have to make a decision about a, a one-liner on a consent form. So uh, the People Matter Project is a, a video project that we've developed that has very short animated on um, videos that are just intended to try to help both community members as well as people working in the research field think about what might, how we might get to a more engaged approach um, with our work and why, thinking about why, trying to explain this story about why we need everyone to participate and why everyone's participation really matters here. So just telling that story is helpful. I want to also touch on just one other kind of reframe on privacy, which I think we often, privacy gets interpreted frequently in this what I would call the negative right to privacy of will protect your information on your behalf. Um, there is this positive right to privacy that, that comes from an old, old legal proceeding, which is this is really more about privacy, it's about people's right to make decisions about, about their stuff, about who has access to their data and for what purposes. So people often make claims about the Facebook generation, um, just putting putting lots of information out there and not worrying about it. But it's also the case that people make their own choices about what they put out there um, on Facebook and how we use you know, online uh, payment systems and so forth. We make choices about that. So what we would like to see in a research setting is that we have a, an analogous opportunity to make 
some some pretty discreet choices about about who we're sharing our data with and for what purpose. And fortunately, uh, it's getting easier to do that. I think we're at this really exciting cusp of culture change right now, where we've got some some of the the old ways that we used to have to get in touch with people or keep track of people or communicate with people. Um, we're moving into a place where, and with cloud computing and with mobile technology, it's just gotten much, much easier to have, uh, to manage manage information and reach people in different ways. So it's just, this. the point here is just really trying to take all, we're, we're, we're just at a disruptive moment within um, both our research ethics tools, our old consent tools, our old regulations, and trying to apply that in a whole new world of uh, genomic technology, information technology, uh, communication technology, and how to how to move these uh, move these forward together. So holding on to some of our old-fashioned stuff, I, I think really these the former old principles of research ethics are still have something to teach us. Really grounding our work in respect and demonstrating respect. Really thinking clearly about how our genomic research is going to advance, um, achieve benefits uh, for human health and, and for particular humans, uh, and that those are equitably distributed, as Lisa mentioned. So there's just a couple examples I wanted to highlight, and I know um, you're, you're hearing from Robert Shelton on, in a, another month or so, who's going to talk more about his private access system and some of his collaborations with Genetic Alliance. Um, but there's there's just a whole suite of emerging tools that really do manage more of these dynamic uh, consent preferences. And here's just one of them, recruitsource.org. The idea is that individuals, as they enter into a research registry, uh, to be recontacted for um, for potential future research projects, they can set their preferences in the way that, ways that they want to. So they can either put their data all in for all access and all use, or they can ask uh, permission. They want to be asked each time that a study comes up. And with, again, with mobile technology, what this might look like is, from a researcher point of view, you're just sending a single email out to the cohort of, of uh, potential participants who want to be invited in uh, explicitly. An email goes out to their uh, to their iPhones, and they can see some information about the research study. They can learn more about the researcher who's doing the study. Uh, they can ask questions, and they can choose to consent or decline uh, that they contribute their data or participate in this particular study. So just things are just getting easier, um, which is exciting. So I think some of the things that we felt like would be impediments to progress or would slow things down or would just be impossible to manage um, from a resource perspective are starting to be possible. Um, so I think in, I'll just end here, which is to say, to reprise the idea that really thinking about the regulations as providing an important floor for us that our systems must meet. And then really the creative opportunity is thinking about where we want to go as a community, as a research community, um, as a society about with standards of excellence about what's possible for us. So I look forward to your comments uh, and your questions going forward. Thank you. Super. Thanks very much, uh, Kelly. And thanks, Lisa. Uh, first, I want to ask if either of you have questions for the other. This is Lisa. I'm I'm great, and I appreciated uh, many of, of Kelly's comments. I think uh, many were quite in line with uh, what we talked about in terms of new and even as we speak emerging um, privacy issues related to whole genome sequencing. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the questions from from the participants. Thanks. Super. So to remind everyone who came on a little late, uh, we are taking questions in the question box. Um, I've teed up a, a couple here that I'll be asking the uh, speakers, and you should feel free to write those questions in the box at any time during this conversation. Uh, so the first question, I think, comes from a researcher. Um, so, But we could take this either way, actually. Um, so it uh, says, research samples are considered to be the property of an institution once they are donated. What about genomic data obtained from those samples? 
are we stewards of them or do we own the genomic data? So again, because I don't know whether that's from a researcher or from a participant, um, I think you can answer it uh, from either perspective. And either one of you can go first. Lisa? Do you want, I can I can answer from an ethics perspective. It also sounds like there's a legal question embedded in there, which I don't know if you can address. I think, you know, ethically, legally, it's true that if especially with with um, federal, if if data is obtained through federal contracts, you know, and it's a federal contract with a university, um, that that data becomes both both property of the university as well as the federal government has uh, requirements around that data as well and has required data sharing of genomic information, for example, into some of our federal databases. So I think the ownership question is, is complicated, which I think is why we've shifted to thinking about stewardship uh, because individuals would also, I think from an ethics perspective, indivi some individuals really think uh, really experience a feeling of ownership around that's their genetic information and they have a right and an ability to make decisions around it um, and so it doesn't it feels counterintuitive to say that just because I've I've contributed one of my samples to this research project that I lose all rights to that that data and so this is I think law and ethics are not always completely <laughs> overlying uh, overlapping and just some of our human intuitions about where are my, where do my interests lie, and then what are our responsibilities to really respect those interests. Uh, that feels like the question that stewardship gets into. Um, thanks for that, Kelly. This is Lisa. I think the it's a great question because I think the the we talk about old models and new models, and I think uh, Kelly mentioned that. I think this is one of those situations where. We are on the cusp of, of um, maybe a square peg and a round hole in the in the legal realm. I'm I'm not a lawyer and I don't do property type law, but um, but I do think that there there have been a couple of interesting cases around um, you know specimens and other things. I mean, clearly the Gila case is is one where you know the 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 certainly the thought was that the researchers owned these cells and could do whatever they wanted with them and um, did many great things with them. Um, and they were, it was discarded medical waste and there's, there's a, um, you know, there was a, an, a, an approach even with the, with the Moore case in California that um, discarded medical waste is no longer the property, so to speak, of the, of the person. And whether that paradigm actually works with something like whole genome sequencing or with specimens that, um, are not a one-time prop, a one-time thing where it's not like a, a home that you own and sell and you transfer ownership to, and then somebody else owns it for a certain time, and then they, they, um, you know, this is something. Um, these kinds of specimens you could use over and over and over again. You can you can assign ownership, or you can you can share ownership or assign um, uh, rights to many people at once, and um, so that lots of different people can use or have access to um, your your specimens where you wouldn't sell your home to, to 10 people at the same time. You might give your specimen to 10 people at the same time. So there, whether the, the property paradigm um, works for this is, is really an area of vibrant discussion in the legal literature. I'm not going to attempt to interpret it, but I will say that um, it's an excellent question, and I, I do know that it's not um, fully resolved, and I think these issues will push that legal envelope. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Right, and I, I think I would also just punctuate again with the Havasupai case, which is one where, you know, the individual tribal members had voluntarily contributed specimens to a research project uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, and yet, you know, and so legally that institution and those researchers had the, the right to use them and, you know, following, following their rules. However, I think the tribe was able to make a case that, that there, they felt there had been a violation in, in what the expectations were uh, in how they had contributed those, 
those specimens to, to the researcher and to the institution. And so I think it, it is a, an evolving area. Thanks very much. And, and that kind of leads into uh, the next question, which has to do with um, broad and uh, dynamic consent, and a little more about the difference between those. And there's been some recent controversies, uh, a paper and some other conversations apparently happening around this um, that, again, I think there's both the letter of the law, uh, which we see in the Havasupai and even in the old, old Canavan case, and sort of the um, perspective of the participants. So maybe if each of you could say a little bit about your understanding of the differences between broad and, uh, I'm combining a couple questions here, broad and dynamic consent, and also uh, the kind of sensibility in the community that sometimes uh, broad consent's excellent because it moves research quickly, uh, and then the perspective that, uh, in fact, uh, dynamic consent doesn't necessarily inherently slow down research and may, in fact, give us more data over time that's critical for the research we're looking to do. Um, this is Lisa. That, again, a, an excellent question and a really important one. Um, I think we're, again, at an exciting time with the developments around how we um, ascertain and and really honor informed consent. The idea with informed consent in terms of respecting, as a mechanism to respect person, a person's autonomy, obviously from an ethical perspective is to um, ensure a person knows what's happening with their data, knows what they're agreeing to, and, um, and what they agree to is actually honored. And the idea with broad consent, I mean, so first let me just say, because it's a, di a dynamic um, time right now and that, that we are at this um, really highly um, changeable time, people use the terms in different ways. One of the things um, that you'll see in the Privacy and Progress Report is broad consent, as the commission understood it, is a consent that says something like, here's my specimen, do what you want with it to better human health broad, um, you know, whatever you want, whatever you need to do is, is great. Dynamic, different than broad, is, you know, I'm OK with these kinds of um, studies, but I really don't want my data to be used for stem cell research, for example, or for abortion research, for example, or some other kind of sensitive topic. or you know, right now I'm really interested in Parkinson's research. My, you know, grandmother is afflicted and I really want my data to be used for that. I can't really think about anything else right now. Ask me later. So this idea that you would have um, contact and it would be a more of a flexible, um, revisited kind of dynamic consent. Um, there, are, there are pluses and minuses to both. Um, some people have really criticized the idea of broad consent in, in the sense that it, they, they argue that it can't be informed. How can someone say use it to better human health when then the person doesn't know really what it's being used for, or can't really agree to whatever, even things we're not sure we can do yet. We're not sure about what you know, this could possibly be used for. So that's the, the kind of uh, Achilles heel with the broad consent from some people's perspectives. So I think the, the important thing or one important thing with with this whole idea of these other ways of ascertaining and managing consent, one, we have a lot of technology can really help us with this. We, we do have to be careful with um, the, the fact, especially with whole genome sequencing and genomic, genomic uh, research, that we, we don't, we have to be careful we don't exclude uh, in a biased way, um, certain segments of the population who don't have the kind of access to um, the kind of technology it's going to take to manage dynamic consent. And this isn't just hardware or software. It's also stable accounts for um, access to, to, P, to, to participants, like a stable email account or um, those kinds of things. So there is the, um, the, the part that, that uh, nods to justice and equity, and, and it, it nods to that because in order to have to create um, benefits for people of all demographic groups, we need 
people of all demographic groups to participate in the research. So we have to ensure that we have a wide variety of folks participating in whole genome sequencing. We need, as, as we all know, we need a lot larger N, a lot more people participating than in this kind of research than we do in a typical uh, clinical trial or typical uh, uh, clinical research. So just a couple of comments on, on this, but I, I do think, and, and one of the things that was really important that came out of the Commission's report is a recommendation to study these kinds of um, exciting and different novel ways to do informed consent uh, to, to really engage uh, in that process and see if we can't come up with ways that um, meet both the participant and the researcher's needs. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, that was a great overview of, I think, the two different kinds of, of consent and kind of w and, and where we are. Um, and, and I would just add there that it is, I think it is interesting um, to, it, it's a great empirical question to ask with um, disadvantaged communities or with populations who've been historically, you know, mistreated within our, our systems, if, if giving more granular control over what kinds of information they can put forward and for whom uh, and for what purpose, um, if that would help build back trust uh, over time or, or, or not. And I, I, I would love to see some data on that um, as we move forward. Because I, I think the, the value that a more dynamic consent approach really gives us is that we can kind of free ourselves up from what has felt like an intractable debate where, because clearly, and when you just look at the public opinion polls, half of our population are fully ready to give all their data in for, for really any, almost any purpose, but you know, certainly health research, and just, to, and don't really need to hear more about it, just want all their data in and want to accelerate the research. Um, and so having, having a system that really allows those people to just go in and be in, um, and then for the people who do want more either notifications about how their data will be used or, or explicit um, permission giving each time their data is used, that, that it just allows for that differentiation amongst us. And to me, that, that kind of differentiated response to a, to a participant population would be the most equitable because it lets us, it does let the people who want to be all in go all in, as well as giving more control um, to those who, who still would prefer to have that. This is Lisa. I just want to add one thing, Kelly, which I, I think um, adds to your point quite well, which is it, it also, a dynamic consent process also gives a person an opportunity to try out the more controlled consent and then if they're unsure and then as a particular person, eventually if they say, well, yeah, this is okay and I feel all right about it, just go ahead and put me all in. So mm -hmm. it's not just that the dynamic consent is um, consent for each study, but also the dynamic way in which a person um, expresses their consent over time. So it, it ha it, there's a lot of promise, and, and I think the, the empirical data um, will help move this, That's this forward. I love that, um, and I, I, I've thought about it as one way to increase our science literacy as well. It's like if over time I start to get a better understanding of what you mean by how you're using my data and what kind of research projects you're doing, now I just understand so much more about the process and the re research and, and what's happening. And so I think it can serve many purposes. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you're right. And I think we'll, we will get some uh, data fairly soon. In fact, in a project that uh, Kelly is helping us by overseeing and leading our uh, BioTrust ethics team, which is a body uh, that is overseeing genetic alliances, translational science work, particularly our uh, registries for all, which employs dynamic consent and uh, data sharing, data access preference setting. Uh, and interestingly, just and this is certainly not data yet because we're uh, we haven't gotten to the point of asking this in a structured way, but what we're finding is that most individuals um, set their privacy preferences very much like the guide that is from their community, which we offer them, 
and then uh, most, uh, about 89 to 92 percent, seem to set their preferences fairly open, allowing a great deal of sharing to happen uh, with very few setting them in a more kind of closed way. Um, there's lots and lots of questions there about how sick are people who are interacting with the system and how desperate are they for research, what happens when we start to engage the general public on these kinds of issues, um, and what kind of, um, and even the question we'd like to study, uh, do, are the guides in some sense coercive even though they're from the same community and they have the same condition and they're in the same stage of disease, et cetera? These are all excellent questions, Terry, and I think, um, you know, we really look forward to the data. I think they'll be um, extremely instructive, and I, again, the, the hope is that there um, are many different models out there that people will, will test and use and explore to, to, again, really help us get to how can we ensure that the, the progress moves forward, the science moves forward in a way that reconciles this, this idea of people have to trust the system in order to put their data in there in order for us to, to move forward. So it is really, uh, it's less of a, a balance or an opposition and more of a circle, right? We've got to create a system that provides a safe space so more people will feel safe to put their data in. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yes. a good point. Yes, very good point. Well, that brings us to the end of our uh, webinar. We did actually cover all the questions through the conversation. You both uh, navigated yourself through the other questions without knowing them. Um, so that was very good. I, I just want to call people's attention to the screen now. I'm just showing uh, Genetic Alliance's website slash webinars dot privacy. And today's uh, webinar, again, on the conclusions of the report, uh, the, the webinar series continues for the rest of the um, year. The next uh, webinar is October 8th. Uh, we're going to have a, a conversation around technology. Is a deeper dive needed? Uh, one of the questions that some asked when the report came out was, should the report have looked at technology more than it did? And we all understand why it didn't, um, but the idea was that maybe there will be an opportunity to look at some of that. And we'll have Deborah Matthews. Uh, from Johns Hopkins, Robert Shelton from Private Access, and uh, um, uh, Yaniv Ehrlich from um, the Whitehead Institute, whose uh, paper we showed before. And then November, we're going to look at uh, our privacy and whole genome sequencing different in different contexts, for example, newborn screening, non-medical uses, that sort of thing. And, uh, and then uh, December, we'll look at ancestry and other privacy concerns. And then in January, we'll look at engaging the public as citizen scientists. So uh, I want to, again, uh, thank Lisa and Kelly for fabulous presentations. Remind everyone that this is recorded. It is up on our website soon after the webinar is over. Uh, actually, Tanya, who helps us with that, is in Ukraine visiting her family. So it will probably be about two weeks before these are up. Uh, and you should visit them at any time. And all of the prior webinars are also available by um, just clicking on either the PowerPoint or the webinar recording. So once again, thank you both, and thanks to our uh, audience. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.